I am with the venerable Sarah Shulman, <laughs> who has written more books that you can, than you can poke a walking stick at. And what I really want to talk to her today on this beautiful, sunny afternoon in San Francisco is the book that's going to come out in October. It's called Conflict is Not Abuse. So Sarah, I want to ask you, what does overstating harm mean? It's when we, we claim or believe that something is actually more harmful than it really is in order to cover up our own participation in creating the conflict. So how would you say that, the, um, uh, that these things play out uh, culturally or say in, in university environments that you might have seen that? Well, it plays out in every level of human interaction from the most intimate to the relationship between citizens and the state to geopolitics. So, for example, I guess the most familiar example would be Michael Brown is walking down the street in Ferguson, Missouri, and the white policeman shoots him, even though and kills him, even though he's done nothing, because the officer feels threatened. Right. That would be the most grotesque example that we're all familiar with. You know, another example that I address in the book is HIV criminalization, which is this new phenomenon, but it's a global one where governments are saying that people who are HIV positive are mandated by the law to disclose their status to their sexual partners, even if they use a condom or even if they're virally suppressed and couldn't infect anybody. So it's this very punitive thing that is based on stigma and people's anxieties and fears, um, the HIV negative people's anxieties and fears, in which the state is encouraging them to actually call the police on their sexual partners, which in a place like Canada or Missouri can result in somebody being incarcerated. And then the ultimate, you know, the final big example in my book is of course Palestine how Palestinians are people who are endangered, but there's a false rhetoric of harm in which you're described as dangerous. So you see all the way from two people refusing to sit down and talk to uh, occupation, how you see the exact same construction of taking something that's a conflict, which is a power struggle, and presenting it as abuse, which is power over, thereby allowing uh, the, the negative relationship to escalate to such a state that can actually produce death. It's very interesting. So what you've actually identified, obviously, is also a tactic, because uh, really, essentially, when you're accusing somebody of uh, abuse in these contexts where we have very clear, um, you know, power st structural discrepancies, this is a tactic. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The and false accusation of abuse is something that can destroy someone's life or take their life. Absolutely. And it provides them with no means by which to correct it because their effort to actually engage then gets construed as harassment or attack, when in fact it's resistance. And we have to understand that there, you have a right to resist unjust behavior. It's not harassment to resist unjust behavior. It's a basic human Absolutely. Behavior. Now, I just want to ask you, does the book in any way address the emergence of this phenomenon that's sweeping across North American universities called the, the trigger warning debate? The way that I do address the question of trigger is that I have a chapter in the book where I examine four different ideologies and how they assess the trigger plus shunning sequence. Because I noticed that very divergent ideologies still all recognize that there is this sequence where a person is triggered and then they shun instead of trying to understand what they're actually feeling. Um, and that's uh, classical psychoanalysis, contemporary psychiatry, Al-Anon, and mindfulness. Those are the four. And what I find is that they all actually advocate for the same response, which is delay, that people should delay before they respond, and positive groups versus negative groups. Negative groups are the people who you say, um, I'm so mad at my girlfriend, I want you to never speak to her again. And they say, yeah, I'm going to get her. That's a negative group. And a positive group is the person who says, how can I help the two of you sit down together and, and hear each other? So just reinforcing the victimized concept is a negative group relationship and trying to help people look at their own participation and seek solutions is the positive group relationship. Sarah, yes. I love talking to you. You're amazing. 
every time I talk to you, I'm floored by your irreverence and your willingness to say things that, you know, don't maintain the status quo. They're just honest, they're true, and they're not necessarily safe to say. And I appreciate you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Peace out. Okay.